Welcome to She Done It. I'm Caroline Crampton. One of the things I love about reading detective fiction from the 1920s and 1930s, what we call the Golden Age, is what I learn about that time period just from its whodunits. There's so much social and cultural history contained in the pages of even the most seemingly superficial of stories. Most of the time, this process of imbibing the contemporary context is entirely enjoyable. But occasionally, a word or phrase comes along that I've never seen before, and I'm reminded anew that almost a century separates the publication of these books and me deciding to read them. These are expressions that would clearly have made complete sense to the 1920s reader, but are now completely opaque to us in the 2020s. And so I decided to make a glossary of sorts, in an attempt to gain a better understanding of what Golden Age detective novelists were really trying to say in their stories. And to do this properly, I've called in an expert, long-time friend of She Done It, Helen Zaltzman. Helen is the host of The Illusionist, a marvellous podcast about language, and generally an enthusiast of all kinds of linguistic curiosities. All of the words and phrases that you're going to hear us discussing today are ones that I've either encountered during my own reading, or they've been sent in by members of the podcast's paid membership community, the She Done It Book Club. If you'd like to be in on creating future episodes like this, you can become a member now by heading to shedoneitbookclub.com slash join. It's also a bonus episode with about half an hour of extra word discussion that will be published later this month just for members to enjoy. So if you'd like to hear more of our conversation, you can do that once you've joined the club too. Now, let's get into the glossary. So the first word or phrase that we're going to try and define for you today is this pair of Ak Emma and Pip Emma, which my understanding is that it's something to do with time. It comes up, I think Peter (laughs) Whimsey says it a fair amount uh, as a kind of stylized way of referring to a a rendezvous the time for. But it also, I think, lots of listeners might have come across it in Agatha Christie's A Murder is Announced, where there are actually characters with names that reference these particular phrases. <laughs> so, uh, Helen, is this something that you'd come across before? I I didn't retain it if I had, but once I read what it meant, I thought, oh, that is obvious. Uh, because it, Ak Emma is AM, as in morning, and Pip Emma is PM, as in afternoon. Mm. And it was early 20th century signalers names for the letters a p and m ah, so sort of signalers as in like military yeah. artillery type signaling right yes british army they 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 didn't yet have the uh, you know the nato spelling alphabet that we have now you know the uh, i always forget what it is like alpha bravo um but it was like a precursor to that uh, from the late 19th century and I think in 1898, the War Office issued it, but they didn't have uh, words for every letter yet. They only had ones for mm-hmm. letters that were easily confused. So Ack, um, they had beer or bar for B, but then nothing until Emma for M, um, and then Pip for P, S's, Tok, and Vic. And then they kind of developed that during the First World War. And after that, they uh, had words for everything. Uh, after that, they had words for every letter, but still not the ones we use today. I suppose now you wouldn't have Emma for M because people would be confused because they'd be expecting the letter M to be represented by a word that begins with M. Mm. But in 1898, they weren't held back by that kind of expectation. <laughs> yeah, I'm also imagining, I could be wrong, that this might stem from a time when you were using the voice more in communications mm. like this. So it was more people saying stuff over the radio rather than spelling it out in Morse or whatever. I don't know if that's right, but that's what I'm imagining. But I suppose that makes sense with um, with Peter Wimsey then, who famously has this backstory of you know having served and being very traumatised by his his time in the trenches in, in the First World War. So he's 
he's still peppering his conversation with phrases that would have been common then. Yeah, although conversation you could just say afternoon, <laughs> which is <laughs> <True. laughs> harder to uh, mess up. Uh, but also, I just think that outside of the mystery novels of that period, thinking of like reading children's books from uh, 40s, 50s, 60s that were still using this kind of war, World War military slang. So I guess kids picked it up because war fiction would have been, you know, very heroic and all of that. So it lasted a, a really long time. I don't know how long people were saying Pip Emma for, but um, as a genre of things people dropped into conversation rather than in just military context, it seems to have had decades of use. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think I've definitely, I feel like I've definitely come across it in school stories as well as in whodunits, anything that's got that either actually from that period or people trying to hark back to it by being archaic in their their slang. Right. Um, I can imagine a lot of people in our current cabinet would be uh, trying to sneak it back in. Yeah, I bet they say Pip Emma. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's very interesting. Thank you very much for enlightening me on that. Okay, so this next one I know is one that you you know about because I think I've heard you talk about it on Answer Me This. <laughs> doesn't, your podcast, doesn't mean I'll remember what I said. A very long time ago. <laughs> but this is a word that I had never come across before seeing it in the Agatha Christie short story collection, The Thirteen Problems. Banting as a I'm from context, I'm gonna say it's a kind of diet. Someone is described as banting when they won't eat pudding, I think. Yeah. Well, um, it was basically what people used to say at the time before they would say dieting to mean mm. what you weren't eating rather than just diet as in foods you did eat. And um, it's an eponym named after William Banting, oh. who uh, was uh, a big deal in undertaking in the 19th century, he had the royal warrant for undertaking. And um, he also wrote a booklet in 1863 called Letter on Corpulence addressed to the public, <laughs> which was an open letter. It was basically uh, like an infomercial for a diet that he had done. And he, and he was saying, I, I did all these unsuccessful fasts and regimes and spa breaks and exercises, and this is what worked. Um, so he didn't invent it. He was, uh, he was bestowed this by uh, someone else. But it was essentially a popularization of low-carb dieting. Mm. Uh, he was eating uh, meat and vegetables and fruit and dry wine and avoiding starch, um, fat and sugar. And uh, it was a very popular diet for a long time and, and people are still doing spins on it. Although the word banting is it maybe a little too comical to have stuck. Mm. Well, that's so interesting because the, the story that it, it comes up in is one that's concerned with poisoning and, uh, you know, the issue bad part of, of any bant regime. Bad part of any bant. But so there's three people who eat the meal that is poisoned, but then the detectives are able to say, oh, well, you know, this person didn't eat this element of the meal because she was banting. And that's oh. sort of the explanation as to why she didn't get sick when the others did, or if I'm Incredible. remembering rightly. And uh, yeah, without knowing what that word meant, it's a little um, little hard to follow. But no, that's really interesting. So there was, in fact, a Mr. Banting. There was very much so. And it's interesting that this, that he wrote um, in his 60s, sort of overshadowed the work he did for decades in undertaking. But I suppose mm. you don't remember the celebrity undertakers of any era, do you? <laughs> I could not name uh, a single one. Do you? <laughs> um, he um, And he donated all of the profits of his best-selling diet book to charity. Hmm. Well, I guess yeah. good for him. Bonus Banting fact. He is distantly related to Frederick Banting, the Canadian physician who jointly won the Nobel Prize in 1923 for work on insulin. Ah, okay. Yeah. That one was very informative. I am glad that I got confused by that word. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Okay, so the, the next two, I think they go together. And this, again, is mm. something that I can't point to a single story or book where it comes from. I just think it's everywhere. And this is bee's knees slash cat's pyjamas. Uh, if I was going to use it in a sentence, I would say, uh, Helen is the bee's knees. Aww. Well, very sweet. I can't find the specific 
origin because, well, that's often the way with slang. Just people are saying it long before it is written down, particularly pre-internet, where people now write a lot more like they talk. Mm. But this probably comes from the late 18th century, uh, bee's knees. Bee's knees was first. And um, it meant something very small and insignificant because a bee has small knees, right? <laughs> yes. uh, that many people would interpret this to mean something that doesn't exist, like chocolate teapot. It was, it was that kind of slang category at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, canary's tusks was another one. Fleas eyebrows. Um, Fleas eyebrows. But bees do have knees. Mm -hmm. uh, to be fair to bees, they have leg joints. So I think bees' knees stuck more than canary's tusks because uh, it rhymes. Mm -hmm. And we're simple people that like patterns in things. Um, so yeah, it was it was um, initially yeah something that didn't exist, and then something that was very very small, but then in the nineteen twenties it became part of this uh, sort of fanciful slang um, of the people of the Roaring Twenties, meaning things that were great. So that's uh, like the cat's pajamas as well, the snake's hips, <laughs> another one that didn't stick around, the kipper's knickers. That's my favourite. <laughs> it's a little little smelly, maybe. <laughs> um, the monkey's eyebrows. Uh, so those all meant excellent things. I wonder why cats' pyjamas, though, because I would imagine few, if any, cats have pyjamas. And if they do, they deeply resent being made to wear them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. So I suppose it, it's, it's now, in that sense, it's a hyperbolic expression for something being really good. So I suppose maybe the what you're getting from the hyperbole is the unlikeliness of the pairing in the phrase. Um, like mm. Kipper's knickers, not a thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, your greatness is only one one removed from this fanciful object or something. Yeah. Right. It's a, a next step divinity, I mm. suppose. <laughs> uh, apparently cat's pyjamas might have stuck a bit more because cat was also... Uh, flapper slang for a fashionable young woman. Mm. And then you get like a uh, cat becoming a jazz term, uh, like hep cat. Still doesn't explain the pyjamas. It could be anything, couldn't it? It could be the cat's gloves or other all the clothes <laughs> cats don't wear. There are yeah. so many options. Cats, brogues. Yeah. Hmm. I think every time I read that now, I will think fleas eyebrows. Kipper's knickers. <laughs> Why didn't you say that instead? Kipper's knickers. <laughs> yeah, Flea's eyebrows is pretty funny. Yeah, I do like that one. Okay, so on, on to something I think a little bit different. And this one, I, I genuinely don't know what it means, I don't mm. think. This is a phrase, I came across it in Josephine Tay's The Franchise Affair. But again, I feel like um, anything, not even just crime fiction from 1920s, 30s, you could find this phrase. Mm. And this is... You're describing something about someone's character when you say butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, it's it's um it's basically someone who it has such a a cool demeanor. And, and to me that suggests froideur that someone mm. is too cold for butter to even melt in the the usually warm hatch of mouth. <laughs> but I suppose it was meant to refer to people who were so good. It's, it's usually um, you know, it, it usually seems to be referring to young women who are so virtuous that they wouldn't generate anything as vulgar as body heat mm. and thus cause the meltage of butter. But to me, it just suggests that they are so chilly. Yeah. It's an old phrase, though. Uh, there, there are written examples of it from um, the 1530s. Wow. It's stuck remarkably well. That's so interesting. Yeah, I, I think I would probably, without knowing any of that, have maybe pegged it as a kind of synonym for goody two shoes or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Which actually doesn't make that much sense when you think about it either. No. I also have two shoes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> get me. Yeah. Uh, that, that, I'm fascinated that that is so old, but I suppose butter has been basically the same for many centuries. Yeah. So. Butter and mouths. The technology <laughs> has uh, not really had to be updated. We'll be right back with more words and phrases after the break, including an attempt to finally understand Lord Peter Wimsey's strange speech patterns. 
It's a new year, and I'm sure lots of you have resolutions or intentions about what you're going to read this year. You may well already have a bulging shelf of books waiting to be read, but if you are shopping around for some new titles, I want to tell you about a way of doing that which also supports this very podcast. She Done It has an affiliate relationship with Blackwells, an independent bookseller here in the UK, so that if you buy any book from them via the podcast's link, the show gets a small commission for referring you. The price stays exactly the same for you, but you're making a little donation to She Done It while you're shopping. Any of the links to books in the episode description will do this, or you can head to shedoneitshow.com slash blackwells as well. I do all of my own book shopping with Blackwells because they're an independent, family-run book-selling business with really nice shops and a good digital operation. They also ship books outside of the UK at no extra cost, so if you're based elsewhere in the world and keen to read whodunits that are so far only available in Britain, using their website is a really affordable way of getting the books you want. So next time you're buying a new book, consider supporting She Done It at the same time by shopping at Blackwell's. Visit shedoneitshow.com slash blackwells or any of the book links in the episode description to get started now. Um, okay, so th- this next one, I think, um, was a bit of a puzzler, wasn't it? This is um, Companion. And the sense in which I think you encounter this in Golden Age detective fiction and maybe fiction of the late 19th century as well is in the sense of a a woman, who, often a woman, I'd say definitely a woman, who lives in a household but isn't either servant or master. You know, she's a, a kind of hanger on who's there just for her company. Yeah, that was an interesting phenomenon, wasn't it? I, I is there what is there one on, in Death on the Nile? Yes. Yeah, I don't know much about it because I suppose that's more about societal structures whereby you might have an older, unmarried woman who therefore was thought to be in need of companionship. What do you think the masculine equivalent would be, just have it, calling someone your secretary? I think so, yeah. So I th- I think, and, and again, you do see that in um, books like yeah, Death on the Nile, Murder on the Orient Express, any of the, the sort of travelling murder mystery ones, where you um, you get... So someone who's a solo traveller, maybe an older gentleman or lady, and they wouldn't travel alone. Mm. uh, So they have a companion slash secretary who isn't their maid or their valet. So they're not responsible for washing or dressing them, but they do maybe look after the tickets and make sure the luggage gets put in the the right train and that kind of thing. And yes, they may well be a uh, a relation who doesn't have the means to exist independently. And so they have this in-between role where they are probably not paid a salary, mm. but they get all their their board and their meals, but they have no say over their own life. They go where the person their companion to wants to go. Yeah. It, I, I would imagine also that they are considered higher class than people who are valets or uh, mm. ladies maids but still on a lower rung than the people paying for them it's interesting to think that the gentleman's companion is called something else and something that sounds a bit more businessy maybe yes. they're not considered in need of friendship unlike women yes i think that's a that's a very good point yeah i i don't think i've ever come across a a man with a companion Lonely. in the same way so um, and and it's, it's a mutual thing isn't it both the woman needs to have a companion but also the woman who is the companion she can't just exist on her own that she must have she must be appended to somebody and if she's not going to be part of a married couple or whatever then she must she must have a relation in order to have status yeah yes. or if she'd fail to have children Yes, how defying her natural purpose. <laughs> I think there were still people placing ads for companions in the lady mm. and the oldie until fairly recently. Um, do you think there are some uses of companion in any of these books that might be euphemisms for same-sex relationship, which at the time would have been illegal? I I definitely think that it's 
it's heavily indicated in in a murder is announced actually where there's a couple of older women who live together. I'm not sure that this is truly a kind of companion relationship though, because I think I think they are just referred to by other characters in the book as two friends who live together, but it's really no stretch at all to see that they are clearly a couple. And, you know, they are portrayed, I think, entirely neutrally. They're not uh, condemned or anything for it. I think though you could, I think you could probably see that in quite a few of those relationships, especially where the the two women are of a similar age, where it's not a kind of aunt and niece type companion mm. arrangement. It's more of a, you know, rich friend, poor friend <laughs> type situation. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that the fairly recent history of queer relationships is undocumented because it mm. kind of had to be, or that the kind of signalling of it wouldn't necessarily be something that people later than that time would have known about. So there's a lot of ambiguity in uh, in fiction from well pre nineteen seventy, effectively. Definitely, yes. So yeah, I don't I don't think you can you can say for sure, but I I think it's an entirely valid interpretation to to read to if there's a and sadly, they're not all this way in um, detective fiction, at least. But if there's a kind of amicable companion arrangement, yeah, I think that's that's an open question. And then, sort of related to that, actually, is our our next word, which is um, creature, creature to refer to a woman. <laughs> and this is one that I am re- I've really struggled to to track anything down about this, and I've also really struggled to work out whether it's positive or negative or neutral or some mixture because sometimes it's quite a throwaway comment you know oh she's a silly creature and sometimes it seems very loaded Mm. you know call it someone calling someone oh what a creature she is that kind of thing it seems like it's a a pejorative description for someone so perhaps it's just flexible but uh but yeah it, it it certainly strikes the modern ear oddly i think yeah, I although thinking about it with my modern brain, is this a word? Because it essentially just means a living being. Just means is being, this a word yeah. we need for a gender-free way to refer to mm. a person without the complication of man or woman or girl or whatever? Um, yeah, that's a good point. It, it maybe it could be a where you need a word to say, "I met this person." Yes, they, I I liked them without because you don't yet know them well enough to know how they like to be described or identified. Yeah, perhaps exactly. we do need a word for that or but more you're words right, for but it. The use of it for humans does seem a little bit like you're talking about Gollum or someone like that. Yeah, I think that's maybe why it's sticking in my brain. It's things like Lord of the Rings, and also I've I've recently reread Frankenstein, and I think that the that Frankenstein's monster in the original Mary Shelley book, I think gets referred to a lot as the creature or mm. my creature. I think that's perhaps where I'm getting the oddness from. Uh, does, does mon- how much does monster appear in that book? Um, I couldn't be sure, but I'm not really at all, I don't think. Yeah, because that, that meant um, it's not great. It means uh, a person or an animal uh, with a birth defect. Right, okay. Um, which... Uh, isn't great. So at least creature feels a bit more neutral. Apparently it also meant uh, whiskey in the 1630s. Creature meant whiskey? Yeah, well, I think this was a sort of early 1600s joke because in the book of Timothy in the Bible, there's the phrase, every creature of God is good. So people took that to mean every kind of enjoyable thing for humans is good. So they, they <laughs> took the word creature to mean booze and things like that. And and creature comforts is from uh, around the same era, meaning like mm-hmm. food and clothing and, and so forth. Interesting. Love, love is early 16th century joke. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder whether in the early 20th century, it's usually men talking about a beautiful creature, isn't it? Or she's a mm. strange creature, whether it just suggests the otherness of uh, women to the men of the period. Yeah, it's definitely another one where I cannot think of an example where anyone's ever said of a man, young or old, um, oh, oh, he's a silly creature. No, they'd probably call him a cove or something like that, or a bad hat. Yes, true. Maybe true. a good hat. I don't know. <laughs> Did it ever just strike you in these books that people sound 
so uncomfortable just talking about anything. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. And I think sometimes that's just because the exposition you have to do as a novelist doesn't sound right coming out of Mm. a real person's mouth. But I think some of it (laughs) is just uh, deep repression and anxiety (laughs) about (laughs) saying anything. Yes. Okay, well, let's move on to our next one, which is a phrase I really like, but I'm a bit baffled by it, which is <laughs> don't lose your wool, which I first came across in Checkmate to Murder by ECR Lorak. Now, from context, I think this means keep yourself together or don't yeah. get overexcited. Yeah, it's a it's another don't lose your cool mm. or keep your hair on, keep your knickers on, that kind of phrase. And uh, it was hard to find anything about it. Uh, I did wonder whether it was comparing people to sheep mm-hmm. or just, uh, I don't know, yeah, maybe, maybe it was keep your hair on, but then they extended that to wool because that's funnier. Yeah, I wondered as well whether, I don't, maybe I'm imagining this, but isn't can, can't you refer to sort of a brain as wool? You know, oh, there's only wool between your ears type thing. Ah. I wondered if it was a kind of, Keep keep your brain on straight type right. phrase. Yeah, don't lose your head. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I really Maybe like it though. It, it feels back. it feels very descriptive. It feels Yeah. Yeah. It does. Mm. Well, a bit like or I wondered some a bit like um, you know, the how people use the word spoons where they say, you know, they just don't have any spoons left for that. Yeah. I wondered maybe we're all allotted a certain amount of wool and <laughs> you need to keep tight hold of your wool. <laughs> Do, just in case. <laughs> just in case. Keep hold of your wool. Um, okay, well, let's um, move on to Ha Ha. And this one comes, this was actually sent in by quite a few different uh, members of the She Done It book club. I asked them for any funny phrases that they came across in their reading. This is actually from the title of a novel by the writer J.J. Connington. And the title of the book is The Ha Ha Case, which if you saw that on the front of a book, you might think it's about comedy or a music hall star or it's funny in some way but no a ha ha is i believe actually a landscape feature that's right yes it's a, a ditch <laughs> <laughs> a lovely ditch uh, and it was uh, designed to keep uh, livestock grazing in a certain area of your massive estate <laughs> without building a wall that would interrupt the view so it was often a ditch with a wall built into the ditch where they they couldn't really leap out. And it's frustrating to me whenever etymology of terms is unclear or people have a lot of different explanations and all of them are disputed. So unfortunately, this is one of those. And some people say, well, it's an abbreviation of half and half because it's half a wall and half Mm -hmm. a ditch, which um, I don't buy it. Some say that it's because the son of Louis XIV of France was stopped from going near the ha-ha by his governess uh, because it was dangerous. And then he uh, saw it and he said, ha-ha, I'm supposed to be afraid of this. <laughs> That's not good enough to me. It does seem to be a French term. And uh, there is still a town in uh, Quebec called Saint-Louis du ha-ha, mm-hmm. uh, which, <laughs> which uh, apparently has the Guinness World Record for most exclamation marks in a town name, <laughs> which is two. Well, two, right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I agree with you. I don't think those any of those explanations are especially satisfying or plausible. No, no, but disappointing. But I was reminded when I was I was asking around a few friends to see if they'd ever come across this phrase, just to try and gauge how unusual is it. How, do people generally know what it means? And one of them reminded me that we went once we went to the opera at Glyndebourne, and we were having our picnic in the grounds beforehand and uh so one of our group got very panicked because they thought a sheep was about to charge over and start eating our sandwiches <laughs> and then upon greater uh, investigation we realized that no because there was a ha-ha in the way and we'd just oh. been deceived by the landscaping wow see just uh, messing with your eyes but mm. not interrupting the view exactly yeah and it was so it worked so well <laughs> that we we thought the sheep would just be able to sort of toddle over and tuck in but no there was a big ditch in the way apparently they also used ha-has in some uh asylums uh so that the patients could see a view but couldn't get out right the idea being that the sight of a massive wall would be too depressing 
Yes, it'd be quite forbidding. Hmm. Uh, the other thing I learned is that ice houses were often embedded into ha-has because the ground around them was uh, good for, you know, insulation. Right, so this is pre-refrigeration means of keeping your stuff cold, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Why not? It's a multi-purpose feature <laughs> in your estate. Yeah, if you've, if you've dug a massive ditch purely for aesthetic reasons, you might as well get some use out of it. <laughs> right, keep your sheep out, keep your patients in, keep your food cold. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so this next one, I think I actually first came across in a PG Woodhouse novel, but it then also comes up in lots of golden age detective fiction mm. from the 20s and 30s. And this is Make Love, used in senses where it's quite clear it's not our modern use of that phrase. Yeah, I think it has been in use way longer um, to mean courtship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was familiar with it from books to mean to woo or, mm -hmm. or to do a courtship, e even if it was ardent. Ardent making love, which I assume was maybe some kind of mild but non-penetrative touching plus sweet yeah. talk. It's an it's a, a English version of a French term, uh, faire l'amour. And um, interestingly, that uh, is dated from the 1500s, but it meant sexual intercourse by the 1620s, whereas it stayed okay. in English till the 20th century just to mean wooing. And I suppose because uh, French and French romance poetry was considered, well, romantic. And then I think American... English developed the sexual meaning in the late 1920s, mm -hmm. um, presumably independently. The first written known example is from the 1927 play by Mae West uh, called Sex. <laughs> the play's just called Sex, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, that's a good crossing over point. That's interesting though that the, at, at least in American English, and, you know, some of the British Golden Age authors that I talk about a lot on the show had really big American readerships. Um, it's interesting that it was crossing over in American English at right at the time. So they might have actually, American readers might have had the same experience I do, reading how, you know, some characters saying, um, if you don't stop that, I'm going to take you and make love to you in this bush. And mm -hmm. I'm sort of like slightly giggling, like, well, that doesn't seem quite right with the atmosphere of the, that novel. They might Unless have had the same wrong because we're like well they didn't have sex in the olden times did they maybe they did <laughs> maybe they did just being euphemistic about it very true yeah so this next one pucker saib i hope i'm saying that right this is something that i think i first came across in the secret garden that children's book mm. um and because Mary Lennox, the main character in that, has been born and brought up in colonial India and then has been sent back to Britain. And so she's got this slightly sort of Anglo-Indian vocabulary. Um, but it comes up, I think Captain Hastings uses it a lot in Christie books to mean good egg or good chap. Yeah. Good hat. And, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I don't I don't really know much about where it where it originates from other than just, you know, the British colonization of India. Well, I remember my mum saying pucker a lot. She mm -hmm. probably still does. It's her and Jamie Oliver who are still saying the word pucker. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else is. Um and it comes from I think it's uh, Punjabi words. Uh so the pucker was absolute. Mm -hmm. Um and Saib was master. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, meant to be kind of a compliment to um, the Indian people's uh, colonial masters. So like an excellent fellow, but also definitely an overlord mm -hmm. type of expression. Whereas I think now when people say pucker, they mean, oh, that's really great. Which is, of course, uh, somewhat uh, glossing over a lot of the connotations of uh, British Empire and the Raj and all of that. Yeah, that's interesting that it definitely had that dynamic of um, sort of authority, a difference in status about it. Because I do wonder, just thinking about when, I think Hastings most often uses it, actually, now, now I think about it, about men that he really looks up to, mm. that he admires. So, you know, his character, he's often very impressed by very 
hyper masculine men who do <laughs> shooting and hunting and all, all that of kind of stuff and i'm wondering whether his description has still has a little bit although obviously without the colonial dynamic a little bit of that in it that it's something you say about someone you see as your social superior yeah it certainly does seem like the kind of thing hastings would say mm. i'll buy it yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay well then our our last word to discuss is probably the hardest to demonstrate because I cannot do the voice. But this what, is what? the yeah the use of what as an interjection or a punctuation, either at the beginning of a sentence, so people say what or what what, but then also ending a sentence with it. So Peter Whimsey says this all the time. He'll say, uh, and you're coming for lunch, aren't you, Charles? What? <laughs> Where grammatically that makes no sense, but it just seems to be a kind of interrogative noise that he makes at the end of a sentence well it, it's it's sort of like saying something that sounds like a statement but indicating that it was a question mm. so you're coming to lunch question mark mm -hmm. it, it's functioning like that as an exclamation um it might have like a very old precedent uh, in the old english word what mm. which is the start of some kind of epic poems um where, where it sort of means listen or uh, pay attention, that kind of thing. Um, but also, just like you were saying, the punctuation that we litter our speech with changes a bit. So at the moment, we might use like or you know or I mean, partly to give our brains a bit of time to think of what we're going to say next. So maybe it was just another one of those. Mm. Yes. Is there a word for for that kind of... Mm, verbal probably. interruption yeah i don't know <laughs> word salad yeah um that makes sense but i think it's also uh, maybe it's just the way that maybe it's just a little dialect specific to a social class as well because it is associated with posh people isn't it i feel like mm. it's lord peter whimsy bertie worcester those are the kind of characters who say what what yeah Again, though, it's when you consider the people who got published mm. until relatively recently, do you have the vernacular of normal people recorded all that much? Probably not, no. You have only what uh, the privileged people thought the normal people sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or Charles Dickens, who was journalistic, but mm. I'm not sure that all publishers would have been uh, open to exact transliterations of how people actually talked but what ho as well feels very much of a period mm. throughout the pip pip that's another whimsy favorite yeah <laughs> just what is it for what is it for yeah it does it does sound very alien to us now but i i, I think when i first started listening to the bbc radio adaptations of the peter whimsy stories because they do you know, do his dialogue fairly verbatim from the books. I, you know, there are all these scenes where Whimsy, you know, wanders over to a farm and gets chatting to someone working in order to learn something that is useful to his case. And you just think, this ordinary person who's busy digging a hole for a fence post, why would they talk to this man who just sounds completely bizarre with his a strange intonation and his strange dialogue? But Either, yeah, A, it's a novel, so Jesus. people will do whatever she wants, but then B, you know, maybe it didn't sound so weird. No, maybe not. I think uh, the uh, strange flourishes of posh men were very much indulged, nay, encouraged <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah, I think they're probably right. That's what it comes back to, doesn't it? Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Helen, for enlightening us on this uh, this round of strange words we found in detective novels. Um, and yeah, I hope as you're reading your whodunits in future, maybe some of this will um, make it a little bit more meaningful. <laughs> Thanks again to Helen for joining me for this conversation. If you enjoyed what we had to say, you'll definitely like her podcast, The Illusionist, 
which you can find at theillusionist.org and in all good podcast apps. Like She Done It, the show is completely independent and supported by listeners, and I'm a patron of it myself. Head to patreon.com slash illusionist if you'd like to join me. I can attest that Helen's behind-the-scenes emails and bonuses are well worth it. And if you'd like to hear more of our discussion, become a member of the She Done It book club to get access to a bonus episode of extra material, as well as lots of other perks, including the monthly reading club and the community forum. Do that now at shedoneitbookclub.com slash join. This episode was hosted by me, Caroline Crampton. Find links to all the books we mentioned and other information about this episode at shedoneitshow.com slash a mysterious glossary. I publish transcripts of every episode, including this one. Find them all at shedoneitshow.com slash transcripts. She Done It is edited by Ewan McAleese, member support for the She Done It book club from Conant McLaughlin. The podcast's advertising partner is Multitude. Thanks for listening. I'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. <laughs>